This is a short companion video to the Pentium MMX MicroOp video, looking at efficiently mapping the different variants to an FPGA. If you have not seen the original video, I would recommend watching that first. This video will do a quick evaluation to see how this pre-decoder would perform on an FPGA in terms of resource usage and critical path. Let's assume that we are targeting an FPGA that is LUT6 based, which will allow us to implement 4 to 1 multiplexers in a single LUT. This is the opcode table that we left off with last time. We can begin by trying to see if it can be simplified further. Unfortunately, there are no bits that can be removed from the table. There appears to be a symmetry used by bit 2, however, the 60 and 70 hex row breaks that symmetry. So let's try a different approach. First, we can break up the table into four banks, with a final selector between 0f and the regular page. Then we can reduce each bank by removing and used bits via KMAP analysis. And then we can group the banks into the LUT6 elements. Here the bottom mapping is folded into the banked multiplexer, since it only relies on a single input. The middle bank requires its own LUT, since it has five inputs. And the top two banks can be merged into a single LUT6 that has two outputs, since combined, they only have five inputs. Finally, an LUT is needed for the 0F multiplexer, which still has inputs to spare. So this is the mapping that we get. A total of four LUTs. However, since the lengths can still vary based on the processor mode, we need three copies of this table. Two copies of the table are needed for the two-bit length value. One copy is needed to evaluate if the length for a given opcode is affected by the processor's data width mode. And then two copies of the output multiplexer are needed to select and compute the output sum. That gives us a total of nine LUTs per predecoder, with a propagation path length of three LUTs. The number of LUTs is lower than you might expect, due to the fact that we already established that the LUT6 can have two outputs, something we needed to combine them. In comparison, if we instead implemented the table as a 256 entry ROM, we would have something like this, which has a total of 12 LUTs. Note that this still has a logic delay of 3 LUTs, so the only difference is an increased resource usage of 33%, but that 33% can add up over 16 pre-decoders. And for reference, this is what it would cost to also compute the offset length for the MMX instructions, and for all of the normal page instructions as well. As you can see, the number of added resources isn't massive, but both offset calculations do add another LUT of delay. And a quick note about LUT delay by adding the pre-decoding into the cache data path, which was mentioned in a previous video. The Pentium MMX had a 4-way 16KB cache. In a Xilinx FPGA, this would be implemented with four BRAMs, one for each bank. The bank address would be address bits 11 down to 5, requiring a 20-bit tag for 32-bit addressing. A 20-bit tag comparison would require three levels of LUTs to do the tag check, with a fourth level to choose which of the four banks to select. So the bank multiplexer coming from the BRAM banks would be five levels of propagation delay. Then also adding three or four extra levels for prefix decoding is probably asking for too much if a relatively high clock speed is desired. Although, we can see that the cache tags are quite wasteful considered that you only need 128 rows, but a BRAM has 512. And on top of that, you would need two BRAMs to cover the four cache tags. An alternative approach would be to use the distributed RAM. In this case, the cache tag check can actually be performed in the previous cycle, since the distributed RAMs do not have a one cycle delay. That reduces the bank multiplexer output to one LUT, and thus the propagation delay with the full offset decoding would be five LUTs, which is still reasonable to achieve decent performance. The trade-off here, though, is allocating the cache tags to the distributed RAM instead of a BRAM. So with this sort of implementation, it may be viable to implement the original pre-decoding method that I had speculated, which would simplify the prefetch buffer logic as well as provide a minor performance boost to decoding on a cold prefetch buffer. After writing the analysis for this video, I went through and implemented a more complex pre-decoder circuit with a four-way set associative cache to see how the inline delay would affect performance. There is a high-level schematic to show the configuration being tested, in which the four-way cache tags, selection logic, and pre-decoder blocks are all propagated in a single clock cycle. Additionally, the pre-decoder was expanded a bit from what was originally mentioned, so that it can properly determine instruction lengths up to 8 bytes in length given decoding of the mod RM byte as well. The table here compares four configurations, with more complex pre-decoding rules. These were implemented with a ROM lookup table that could be easily swapped. All of the implementations were tested on a Dash 2L speed grade, Xilinx Ultrascale Plus device. I was also able to calculate the pre-decoder accuracy in relation to a test instruction stream.
This test stream is different from the simulation videos and is operating in 32-bit mode. The accuracy does include prefix accumulation and microcode instructions, so it's comparable to the result from the simulation videos, although with some relaxed rules to increase performance. As for the test configurations, the special case is identical to the simpler mapping, with the exception that it includes those dropped instructions in the first opcode table. And the plus PREF indicates that all of the prefix bytes are marked as one byte. As for the results, the first thing to note is that the LUT count per pre-decoder is similar to what I had originally quoted. The original sum with offset length calculation would have been around 16 LUTs. Additional fields were required to account for the 16-bit and 32-bit difference, and as I mentioned, these pre-decoders can correctly determine offset length, including accounting for a SIB byte. They do not, however, include any additional offset that may be specified by the SIB byte itself. The reason for a more complicated pre-decoder is that many mid to late 90s era games utilize slightly more complex addressing modes which the Pentium MMX could support on the back end. Essentially, this would increase the decoding IPC without requiring a back end change. With that said, the total ends up roughly double, at 33 LUTs. The next thing to note are the clock speeds. These are all taken from the slow corner. Curiously, the clock speed increases as the LUT usage and complexity also increases. I suspect this may have to do with LUT packing. In the simpler cases, several logical evaluations can share a single LUT, whereas the more complex ones need to dedicate some of those LUTs specifically. Essentially, the larger pre-decoders end up with less routing congestion. Alternatively, you could claim that all of these frequencies are roughly within the stochastic variation of place and route, and will roughly perform about the same. Furthermore, given that the BRAM maximum clock speed on the target device is 585 MHz, these frequencies are effectively identical. And the last thing to note is that the resources used increase as the accuracy increases. The end result is essentially that you could achieve a 5% IPC improvement for roughly a 20% resource utilization increase. Whether or not that's worthwhile is debatable, and would probably depend on real-world workloads. Likely any decision would also need to include the performance implications for the next pipeline stage, as it wouldn't make much sense to spend resources in one place to improve performance, only to drop performance in another part of the pipeline. Either way, using the plus pref cases would be necessary if one wanted to decode SSE instructions at a rate of one per cycle. Otherwise, they would require two cycles to decode. While the Pentium MMX didn't originally support SSA, they could conceivably be implemented with microcode emulation, which would save instruction cache space, bandwidth, and improve pipeline parability. Naturally, I didn't stop here when looking into implementing a pre-decoder, but it very quickly escalated in complexity when accounting for more of the pipeline. The solution ended up being far more complicated, which interestingly appears to be much closer to what Intel actually did after reading through a few patents. While that was able to achieve a slow corner clock of over 400 MHz on an UltraScale Plus 2L speed device, the IPC performance, resource usage, and maintainability make it impractical. But that's a topic for another video or three, so I will leave it here for now. Anyway, hopefully you found this interesting. Thanks for watching.